Hello, welcome to the MMU Philosophy Society podcast. Today we have Tom on, who's from the Poetry Society, who's uh, very kindly agreed to come into on the podcast to talk about his poetry. Uh, so we'll start off, like, why do you write poetry, Tom? What's your motivation? What's your inspiration? Uh, I think my motivation to write in general, uh, it sort of started from an early age, uh, probably when I was about 10 or 11. Um, I, I think back, back in the day, you know, I, did, I didn't really have a good, uh, good time in primary school. You know, the only thing that I really engaged with or, you know, the things I got, so to speak, uh, was obviously the writing exercises that we did, the English lessons. Um, it, it wasn't anything as fancy as what, we, as what I do now as I study English and creative writing at university. Uh, but because I was only in year five, year six, when these writing exercises were being done. Um, but I think those those early creative activities they really gave me a sense of release and almost like an ability to sort of like express my own feelings and ideas, you know, during a time where I sort of felt you know, mishandled or disregarded by sorts by certain teachers and, and classmates. You know, um, I was I was never really you know a fast learner. Um, I always had like a difficulty understanding maths, and you know it was a big problem growing up, especially in the school that that I went to, which which obviously prioritised, you know, uh, those pupils always did well to maintain its image. Um, so whether it was down to like a, a strong uh, imagination or natural ability, I'm not quite sure yet, but I could easily ace the writing activities, you know, it was the, the one thing I was really good at. And I think there was one time that really sticks out, you know, one that I can still really remember a lot. And that was when I really impressed my teacher. And, and in the end, like, I think, a quote that I actually wrote down, it was actually saved. Um, so in some way, you know, writing really did, you know, validate my existence from an early age and it did prove that I did have all this potential and that, you know, all that the teachers really needed to do was sort of open their eyes and see it. Um, so I think, you know, looking back at it now, I still, I think that I still write because I can see the practice in really favourable terms and it isn't like, not, not necessarily, because of the superficial benefits like fame and fortune um yeah so basically you know it's it sort of you know that that negative experience at school it made me just all the more persistent in writing you know it, it gave me a strong sense of justice and you know knowing what's right and what's wrong and and yeah basically that's that's sort of more or less my, my motivation to write and didn't one of your teachers say to you that you you wrote something and then the teacher said uh that you can't put the end on the end of your story because it's only for the end of good stories or something i mean that's like <laughs> yeah <totally>. that's right <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that's kind of surprising you know considering the fact that you know i was, I was probably like 10 or 11 at the time that's terrible you know, so you know i'm sure you can imagine like you know, she wasn't exactly the greatest teacher. I mean, obviously, yeah, well, if you end it's up... a moment that sticks with me, and, you know, hopefully... Well, sorry? Oh, uh, sorry, well, I was just going to say, if you end up being the poet laureate, you know, you can rub it in her face, you know, a little bit. Yeah, well, that's the plan, hopefully, yeah. Fingers crossed I can uh, I can get to that stage in the future time. That's that's definitely the, the plan. <laughs> yeah, poetic. So, yeah, basically, that's, that, that's more or less, you know, yeah, that's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Cool. Um, uh, my next question is: Does an artist have to be a torrent of raging emotion? What is the correlation between the beauty of your poetry and the profundity of your emotions while you're writing it? Do you think that you have to be full of raging emotions to be able to write good poetry? Uh, well, I mean, obviously, that that was a question. That you that really got me actually yeah that that was a that was the one that actually spent quite a bit of time you know sort of like unpacking but I, I think the simple answer that, that I can really give is you don't have to necessarily be you know this torrent of rage and emotion you know you don't have to you know necessarily be always connected into these sort of emotions and you know you know be on either end of, of scale I, I think you know, that with poetry and obviously writers in general there's a massive misconception um, about writers and poets that are you know that they're quite often considered to be, you know, really emotional, you know, that they're, they're always going like from one end of the, of the extremes of, of like sort of like the emotional spectrum. And, and I, I think, you know, that's partly to do with the fact of like what the writers that we were studying in GCSE English and stuff, you know, we, we were studying like Lord Byron, you know, all, all the good 1800 and 1700 classic 
writers who, who you know were, were very well known for sort of their their ability to go from one emotional extreme to the other you know in in, in polite terms uh, so i think that while you can get a lot of ideas from your emotions and you know i, I definitely do really support writers to explore this i think you can't have too much of a good thing necessary in, in my opinion uh, granted there are some writers that are the most productive when they are uh, when they're like in a state of emotional turmoil you know whatever works for them but for me in my opinion becoming a torrent of rage and emotion will be counterproductive in my writing process as be uh, becoming too emotional can leave overwhelmed by your feelings unfortunately there is this common misconception again you know that writers are often very emotionally emotionally distraught um you know but but again i, I think you know that in, in time we'll sort of you know come to realize that there is greater benefits to to, to writing poetry than just the, the pure emotional so yeah that's I, I think that's all i've got to say for it really you think that's a kind of romantic image that doesn't necessarily correlate with real life yeah, I mean, obviously, with, with the romantic movements, you know, when we're all about over exaggerating anyway, you know, the romanticism is, it can sometimes be a, a very weird misconception of life itself. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. No, that's fair enough. Do you find that when you write poetry, you know, you're kind of tinkering around with it? Or do you, th do you feel like it kind of comes out like a flood? You know, like, do you feel yourself more like an engineer or more like a kind of traditional image of a creative artist you know what I mean like well uh, yeah I, I think I can understand you know when um, uh, are you sort of like talking about the idea of you know just like making something in one swoop and you know just leaving it as is or are you talking about you know is in the, the the longer processes is that what you're trying to mean well I just because I've heard a lot about artists where they say that sometimes like the the, the art comes through them rather than they created, it's more like they're channeling something that's coming from somewhere else. Do you feel like that's true? Or do you feel like it's a very kind of in intricate involved process, like making a Swiss watch? Well, um, uh, with, with obviously with creatives of all different kinds, you know, they all use different processes and, and different ways of, you know, creating art. Um, I, I think that, you know, when it comes to like artists, you know, who, who actually, you know, draw and paint, I think, you know, that, that idea of, you know, you know, the ideas coming through and, you know, ideas that, you know, that come through from elsewhere, you know, I do think that's more, that more applies to sort of like art and, and stuff like that. But when it comes to poetry, when it comes to what I do, um, unfortunately, mine's more of a long game. Um, I've been taught quite a lot by um, by a lot of the writers that you know that teach me in my to just you know nail something out in an hour. Unfortunately, that's not going to be possible. You know, the time and time again, you've got to come back to it and you've got to refine it and update it. And and so quite often with a lot of work that I actually uh, create, you know, it's usually the product of you know hours or months or even in some cases like a year or two. Of just like creating just one thing you see it's it's unfortunately it's never as easy as simple you know it's just you know spending a few minutes then bang it's done you know you can just send it on its way you know that the, the, there's a lot of intricacies to writing poetry you know you've you've got to be you've got to take into account things like repetition you know and then obviously spelling mistakes you know it's it, it's quite a lengthy process but i suppose that can be said for a lot of artistic mediums yeah I find the editing to be the most difficult, you know, because sometimes I try and write, not poetry really, but more like philosophy, I suppose. And I just find like reading it back and going over it, I just want to write, I just want to keep writing. I don't really want to kind of tinker on with what I've written, but I guess that's a flaw really, because I should be more involved with the editing process really and at the end of perfecting the words. Maybe mm. I just need to write more interesting stuff, so it's more interesting well, to edit. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I think really, you know, when in almost any situation, you know, the, the, the editing process is the really hardest because, you know, here's this first draft. You spent all this time and effort in it and, and next minute, you know, you put true in it. You know what I mean? It's, you know, you, you go in there, like you've created something to be told that you've got to take certain parts out and stuff. So I think it can be one of the most challenging things with like return to a piece, especially if there's like this emotional attachment to it. 
and yeah. sort of, you know, tearing it apart and then trying, you've got to sort of bear with it and you've got to see the benefits of it, you know, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of these editing processes will make your work stronger. And, you know, when, when it comes to the final product, whatever it may be, you know, eventually you will be able to see, you know, the really solid results. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a necessary evil editing as I find. Is that saying, isn't that kill so, your yeah. darlings or something? Kill your darlings. I've never heard of that phrase before. No, <laughs> no, it's, it, that, that's an interesting thing to say. Actually. Uh, okay. So, uh, the next question was about uh, politics. Um, so I wrote it like this: We can't com hope to compete with established authorities by force. Do you think creating art is the best method of making change in the world? What impact can art have on the world? Right. Well, um, when, when it comes to obviously uh, you know making change and stuff, um, I, I do I do one hundred I do one hundred ten percent agree with the fact that art does have that potential to change the world. But at the same time as well, I also you know believe that relying solely on art to bring about change is like sort of like a grave mistake at worst and and sort of a bit naive at best. You know, when I, I think that you know art can uh, no sorry change can you know allow people to you know think and act in new ways and art is obviously great for this you know art can propose new initiatives by showing perspectives you know it is really good at assessing you know, from anything from institutional racism to the silencing of free speech or anything else in between you know it doesn't necessarily be from the left or in, entirely from the right but rather a combination of both um it's 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 definitely a medium that builds up the momentum for change by promoting discussion or getting like-minded people to discuss what needs to be changed and um, how best to do it as well. Um, and you get to see this, you know, quite a lot in poetry, you know, for example, uh, in sort of like the 1920s, you know, immediately after the First World War, there was a group of English poets that included the greats like Buffalo and Prince of Soon, and they stood in contrast to the public perception of war at the time and, and they really critiqued the purpose of war uh, in general by high, highlighting its utility and the tragedy of the conflict through the poetry that they wrote. And as a result, you know, they, they really sort of birthed the, this, this movement, uh, you know, that brought about, you know, change in culture and society where war was no longer considered something as glorious as it seems, but, you know, something that should be or you know, at the very least, it should be like a very last case scenario. Um, so although, you know, it's hard to recognise the place of art in manifesting change, I do think that art on its own can only go so far. You know, like I've already said, it can build momentum, but obviously momentum needs to be maintained. And, you know, I'm, I'm very much of a person who believes that any kind of change can only manifest through like the conscious efforts of an individual or a group of people. You know, I, I, I think sometimes, you know, I, I kind of find myself quite awkward by certain forms of contemporary art because maybe perhaps this might be a bit of like um, a wrongful interpretation, but they seem to do a lot of talking. You know, there's like this, it's like a clique of intellectuals who, who desire change and, you know, make works around their ideas, but they don't do much else. You know, it's almost like as though they're stuck in that sort of state of making momentum for this movement, you know, when. And, and you know, I, I think that I don't consider it to be quite as effective as more physical action. You know, the, a system can quite easily ignore the outcries of a few political creatives. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's very easy to you know just put like a, a curtain over a painting or you know burn books. But obviously, when when there's thousands and thousands of people protesting on the street, and all, so yeah, that's that's basically sort of my do you not feel though that yeah, um, interpretation of, of art? Uh, do you not feel that um, like, uh, a lot of the problems that we face today, it, it's not like a problem of uh, like for instance climate change. Like we could fix the climate. It's more like a problem of people's will to do it. And like in order to have to to get the will to do it, it's not really so much about banging on with the. It's like for instance if you're depressed. And you're just and lying in bed, even just cleaning your room seems like like a massive task that you can't kind of do.
do. And it's like, we haven't got the kind of cultural mindset or something that would allow us to deal with the problems that are kind of facing us. So like, and really in order to get that kind of new perspective from which we can solve a lot of the problems that we're facing today, it does seem like the solution has to come from art kind of thing. Like, because art has the power to kind of change people's lives and change people's minds. And you, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, it's not so much like, uh, because it, although changing the climate could be easy from a certain perspective, in order to get to that perspective, it does seem like we we'll have to, it, it's like an artistic, we we'll have to take an artistic route kind of thing. You know what I mean? In order to change people's kind of mindsets. Mm. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I can I can somewhat understand with what you're going there. Uh, yeah, um, I, I think again, you know, art is one of those forms where you know it, it shows, it, you know, it visually shows an idea, you know, and it, and it really shows uh, like an, an opinion or a perspective in, in like a really intriguing way, you know, it, and through this unique perspective that someone might not actually see, it might might not have actually seen before, you know, it, it might have actually you know make them think, oh, maybe perhaps you know, this needs to happen, you know, maybe perhaps I, I should really alter what I'm doing. But I, I think a, a far more fundamental thing of, that, you know, really prevents change is unfortunately change is difficult, you know, that, that, that's, it's just a simple fact of life, you know, that, you know, by, by changing things, you're somewhat recognising the faults within, say, yourself or a system. And, and sometimes, you know, people don't want to be exposed to this sort of truth or this idea that you know maybe perhaps we haven't got it right yet and yeah that's unfortunately change is difficult and sometimes we just got to make change happen whichever way we want to do it yeah that's that's cool all right uh and the, my next question was what is the point of art what is the point of art okay uh yeah so the the point of art is um, I, I, I suppose the, the whole purpose of art is, is, is something that, that, that's been constantly debated that, that, that people, we, you know, even to this day struggle with, you know, that unfortunately, you know, a lot of people have got all these different ideas about what it means and stuff. And, and again, you know, it, it means different things to different people. And, and you know, that's, that's totally fine. So I, I can I can only really sort of like you know really talk about about like how I think about it. It's um, yeah, I, I think when when it comes to me and what I think the meaning of art is, um, I, I think you know I sort of remember like you know the, the what the, this group of people called the Monument. Uh, the, the I think there was a film done about it in sort of like the early twenty tens. Um, that that had uh, Matt Damon and uh, George Clooney you know, playing part of it, and it was based on this group that was nicknamed the Monuments Men. And, and during World War Two, you know, these these individuals, you know, who were like art, art historians, curators of, of a certain age, they they actually went around, you know, that they've put their 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 lives physically in danger, you know, by being on the line during the second world war and their whole job the whole job of the monuments men was to make sure that art and, and thereby culture was was preserved and there was there was plenty of times you know that where the american governments uh, i think it was under truman at the time you know they, they really sort of questioned the whole purpose of of this of this um sort of organization that went out and and you know went out in order for the preservation of the arts uh, you know, during a time where you know fighting was still a very real thing, you know the, the you know the Nazi regime in 1944 and 45 was was becoming more and more volatile and it was becoming far more aggressive, and it was pursuing scorched earth policies that were seeing you know hundreds and hundreds of valuable collections of art being destroyed or you know taken away and, and hidden in locations. And when obviously Truman, you know, really really said when Truman discussed this with with one representative of the monuments man and and he was sort of questioning like is a life worth a piece of art and, and this guy basically turns around and said well 
you know, art is is basically us. You know, when when a piece of art dies, you know, an art of our culture is also killed off. You know, but art is really significant, and, and I think you know, with without art, we you know we we, we miss the beauty and the, and the hidden detail of life. Uh, you know, and, and I think you know it's it's always needed. Art is is always the most one of the most important things in life itself as it may seem you know that there's always struggle there's always suffering and and art helps to you know show people you know that there is this hidden beauty and and you know that it's there is this culture there is this identity and you know that's it, it makes art not only have a purpose but it also makes art valuable and by extension it means that art is worth preserving you see that's that's sort of like my my belief of, of art itself. It's, it's a natural part of being human, isn't it, to make art? It seems like it's what human beings do almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, when, when, when we crawled out of that primordial soup, you know, millions and millions of years ago, and then when we started to evolve, you know, it was like we were, we were like, you know, putting you know, in hand paints and, and you know, like... In our, our hands, you know, on cable, so, you know that that was art to 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 a certain degree, you know, that you know ever since we, you know, ever since we were starting to evolve, you know, right from the beginning, we were in some shape or form making art. So without so without art, then perhaps we want to have existence itself, you know, maybe perhaps you know that both of them are connected and you can't have both without the other. That's that's sort of my feeling on it. I mean, I don't know if you believe in God, but I mean, from that kind of traditional perspective, the world is kind of a piece of art, isn't it? You know, like the it, we call it creation or whatever, you know, like the world does seem to have a certain kind of artistic quality to it. You know, I'm not saying I'm not saying it was created or anything. but you know. No, no. I mean, um, obviously, I was born and raised a Roman Catholic. But, you know, I, I won't necessarily call myself a devout believer, you know, I I. Um, I do believe in science, you know, don't get me wrong. I do believe in, in natural evolution and stuff. But, yeah, maybe perhaps there is some higher being, whatever that may be, behind that science. You know, maybe perhaps this, or, or this great world that we're, that we're now inhabiting may be created by something that was greater, that was using science. Who knows? You know, with that, unfortunately, I, I, my, my pay grade doesn't really cover those questions. So that's... That's not what I'm here for. <laughs> well, you wrote a poem called, is it Sir Nonos? Sir Nonos? Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's Celtic, so obviously the, the translation is a bit iffy. You know, it's, yeah, but yeah, basically, yeah. And were you going to read that on the poem, uh, on the uh, podcast? Uh, would you be so kind as to read that? I think we we're, were talking about it before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... Certainly, yeah. I don't, I don't have um, an issue at all with that. I'll, unfortunately, I'll just have to uh, get it up quite quickly. It's, um, yeah, it's it's one of those poems that you know. Once again, it was it was tapping into sort of like my love for nature. Really, it was um, one of those things that I really enjoyed doing when when I was actually writing it. And I think I think I was actually writing it actually during a time when um, when I was still studying actually and, and I think I included it on the assignments and stuff and I did well on the assignments so I, I think it must have some sort of uh, artistic merit that's for certain <laughs> yeah that yeah. one stood out to me I quite it's, like uh, that one yeah mm. um, I'm glad I'm glad it shows that I'm, I'm sort of doing my job here <laughs> so yeah um, I've, I've got it up now anyway so um, do you want me just to uh, read now or that would be cool, yeah. Okay, sure thing. So here's uh, Sununos. My name was a hushed wonder scrubbed across hills with dark symbols declaring my god godhood to the shimmering heavens. Humans asked for my permission and mine alone to feed off my cornopia as an infant would suckle on their mother's breast the juiciest apples, fertile land, healthy animals, everything. But they worship at other altars now, leaving me different offerings. The great day crawls closer, poured heads and vibrant blues. Uh, when new winter that a lonely ends, once 
everything I know has been flattened and rolled. Where mighty pines once stood, now lies pride bark. Their carcasses burst wide, with sap flecked across the leaves like stains left from a murder, though that isn't the only gift they leave. Cousin dear and brother brawl are long gone. I found their heads screaming, reddening the soil as they are washed away, a premature autumn, the birth of blood and tears. Many drops of life were spent in my name, but now they are supposed to quicken mem my end a task bound by blood is this how all humans feel so yeah that's that yeah. is it that is it very cool thank you thank you mm. i like that kind of old god stuff you know like the old like uh it reminds you of like old england with the twisted trees and the fair fairy folk and stuff like that you know it's it's quite an enchant and kind of it's imbued with folklore you know mm. yeah well then that's that's obviously that I always like writing about him. I do, I do like me me old English mythology and stuff. You know, I'm a really avid reader, like the Beowulf. You know, so I, I think it's me. It's it's very natural for me to write about those kind of things. Yeah, certainly. I had a few questions about that poem. So, do you think that human beings have turned against nature, become unnatural? So aren't human beings just as natural as bumblebees and blackberries? Are we separated from the rest of nature? Um, well, I, I do think that humanity has, has grown further away from nature because of how we've, how we've evolved over time. I think it's somewhat ironic that, you know, natural evolution has, has caused us to reach a stage of disconnection with nature, you know, that while other plants and animals remain bound to the side, of nature, humans on the other hand are the only really species to have attempted to dominate the cycle of nature uh, you know, humans have learned more about the intricacies of nature through, you know, developments in science and I think it's almost made us think that, you know, we're superior above all else in the world and, you know, that we don't need to obey the laws of nature it's, yeah, it, it's almost like as though, we, in one sense, that we're sort of playing God you know, that We've got this this ability to do things, and and we're doing it just for the sake of of doing it, rather than without any sort of reason or motivation to it. So it's us that are kind of struggling and straining to get away from nature's grasp, almost. Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, you know, unfortunately, nature, especially you know, when in recent years, has proven that you know, it's not necessarily something that you should play with you know it's, it's not something that you should mess around with uh, you know un unfortunately there's been you know massive earthquakes and, and fires and you know, wildfires fires in Australia and in America you know so it's quite clear that you know maybe perhaps nature is sort of telling us you know that, that we're not necessarily the masters yet of of the world you know that maybe perhaps nature still is the more important one maybe the old gods are kind of uh, kicking back, you know. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Mm -hmm. So you know, maybe perhaps the uh, maybe perhaps they are the actual gods. Who knows? You know, that's 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 another question entirely. Though, I suppose. So then, how do we reconcile ourselves with nature? Uh, because mm -hmm. even if we like use technology to clean up our environmental act, there would still be kind of a breach between. You know, we there's something about us where we feel unnatural. You know, we feel kind of like we don't belong in a way, like we call ourselves humans, and we make a like a distinction between the natural world and the human world. So even if we did clean up the environment, there would still be we would still be we would feel alienated. You know, and how do we reconcile that? Is the solution poetical or artistic? Maybe. Well. Um. I, I, you know, by the in order to you know clean up our environmental acts, um, I, I think there's there's a there's a great flood of artwork, and you know there is a lot of poetry that, that that's going around um, at the moment about you know environmentalism, and you know, a, a few of the pieces are really profound, but unfortunately, I can't necessarily remember too many of them, and I can't really find. I, I think this this sort of like demands. You know, to make environmental change happen, you know, it has it has created this this flurry of of you know we're really fabulous art and stuff that 
you know, is certainly paving the way for, you know, greater momentum. But I think fundamentally, you know, the, the things that are going to make the most amount of changes or should I say the change that, that's really going to matter you know, it, are the things, you know, where, where humans, you know, reduce their carbon emissions, you know, they, they look to other renewable sources of energy. I think those are going to be the major decisions where, you know, things are, are going to happen the most, you know, where we'll finally be able to uh, to get back to, you know, living in harmony with nature. Uh, but yeah, in, in terms of, you know, go, going back and and sort of, you know, living back with nature, you know, I think it's, it's also to, to bear in mind that humanity has come too far to return to this state of sub, subversience on nature. You know, our whole way of living has become dependent on like the advancements humanity has made when we no longer remain shackled to, you know, the ambiguous uh, power of nature. You know? Um, I think that humanity chose to base its existence on fearing and obeying, and obeying perceived manifestations of nature's worldly power, be they God's divine signs. You know, they conducted barbaric practices and believed in superstitious fiction that prevented them from improving their lives. You know, that if, if we decide to become, you know, subverse, if, if we decide to, you know, go return back to nature and, you know, live off the land and, and you know, basically destroy everything we've, we've built up so far in, in over hundreds of years, you know, that granted we might come back to nature, but then we'd also have to, you know, retake those previous things that we did, you know, which, which includes, you know, those, those animal sacrifices and, and, you know, generally barbaric practices and, and stuff like that. So it, it's never as easy or as simple as, as, you know, returning back to nature, you know, that I think we do need to strike up a balance where we can remain in the world with everything that we know and everything that we've learned in like from like the 1800s and, you know, to the 2000s when it comes to science and, and technology without sort of, you know, become, you know, without becoming subverse, sub, subverse even, you know, to how nature is, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I'm I'm not sure that like I'm not sure that going back to nature would necessarily mean that we went had to go and live in tents. You know, because I, I, I think I feel like you know it's something to do with like accepting the human spirit or something. Like we feel like a little bit like alienated and distant. Do you think that we we should go back to those kind of old mythologies of of you know like pantheism and stuff? Because it does seem like the Christian uh, Abrahamic legacy that we've been kind of saddled with for, with for a few thousand years is kind of an unnatural religion in the sense that it's like it's this guy who lives, you know, like this transcendent God who lives in this kind of realm who's kind of separate from nature. And we kind of identify ourselves with that God. And so we, we kind of have this image of ourselves as somehow separated from the world and we we manipulate the world in the same way that god does you know like god looking down from heaven manipulates matter like that there's a certain mm. distance there you know what i mean whereas like the pagans that you know what i mean the pagans you know like the, the old religions the, the mm. religions of the earth you know whereas god is kind of coming at looking down on the earth from somewhere else and so we mm. see ourselves in that way looking looking down on nature rather than as a part of it ah right so um we're sort of like in in one sense then you, you're saying that, that we're mirroring you know the gods that we support to believe in you know that we're trying to you know play as those kind of people uh, yeah that it's a really interesting argument you know um i, I suppose with christianity you know that there is that sense you know that are obviously the God, the the God that we believe in, you know, the Holy Trinity, you know, there there is always that omnipresence, you know, that omnipotence as well, where, you know, where we see God as this being that you know is all knowing, all powerful, and all seeing, you know, it, almost like Sauron in a way, you know, from Lord of the Rings, you know, he he knows everything, he can see all, you know, it, that there is definitely that that sort of aspect, and yeah, may, maybe perhaps. There is people out there that have tried to, you know, become this sort of God. But I've got to be honest as well, though, you know, when paganism and, and other things, whilst they do have an, a different perspective with Earth, you know, they, they definitely do have this connection and, and this 
sort of, you know, oneness I uh, find with sort of like, you know, the nature and the surroundings, you know, they too, just like Christianity and almost any religion, they also have the downsides, you know, they sometimes do find with like paganism and, and, and other religions that try to be one with nature, you know, quite often it, it's quite idealistic, you know, that they have this idea of the world that where like they're looking through through rose tinted glasses and, and sometimes they do miss on the harsh realities of life itself. And and you know that that's very dangerous. You know, it's 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 okay to be, you know, to see the world in a really, really nice way. You know, don't get me wrong, you know, if 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 you're happy and you're satisfied, that's okay. But you know, at the same time, you know, you've also got to be mindful of the fact that, you know, unfortunately life is never as easy or as simple as as any which way you know there, there is that darker side to it and and I, and I think you know you must recognize that going forward because because like the in uh christian mythology the earth is a kind of prison isn't it because we, we were banished from paradise and we came here you know like the earth is a kind of it's not where we want to be is it we want to go back to heaven and be with god and so like that you, you can naturally see where a kind of you know, like we mistreat the earth. You can see a kind of continuation, like why we mistreat the earth, because in our mythology, the earth is a kind of desert where we've been banished to, you know? Whereas mm -hmm. like in, in the old, like in your poem with the, where like the, the God is saying they've forgotten me and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. the, those older religions, the earth is our home kind of thing. It's where we come from. It's where we, where we're born, you know? I'm not really sure what yeah. my question is really. No. No, no, no. It's um, no. I, I think I can understand what where you, you know, that, that you're almost saying that you know that that the world is, is not necessarily you know where we want to be. Um, you know, and, and I suppose that that's really demonstrated. You know, in, in obviously that concept of heaven and hell. You know, that there is this sort of afterlife, and and ultimately, that's that's the goal. You know, that that's where we want to be in the future, which is heaven. But I, I think, you know, there's plenty of religions that, that see the world as just merely a stepping stone. You know, there's, there's plenty of religions across the world that see, you know, when are, are obviously you've got um, the, there's the, the Muslim faith itself. It has a very similar idea, you know, that, that the earth is just like in between, you know, well, obviously their version of hell and their version of heaven. And, then, and you know, even going back to, you know, less, uh, less, modern you know and, and far more you know historical and uh, historical religions like obviously the you got the beliefs of, of obviously the, the, the Scandinavians you know from from the 10 hundreds and the 11 hundreds who, who believed in in this concept of Valhalla that you know that if whatever you say and do there you know you, you complete acts of, of you know, complete heroic acts you do these all these great feats and challenges and that will give you a place you know in Valhalla, you know, that, that's where you'll be able to go for all time. Uh, so I, I think plenty of religions, you know, do sort of like abuse and see the world as just, you know, it's just a stopping off point. Guys, you know, it's okay. We can we can wreck it as much when we reach 50 or 80 years old, then we won't be here anymore. So it's okay. It's fine. And and that sort of idea, that sort of perception is, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly not restricted just to christianity you know there's plenty of religions that you know that i suppose just see the world as like a stepping stone and, and nothing more it's not where we want to be it's there's always somewhere else that we'd like to be you know as that famous saying goes you know i've got people to see places to be you know it's that's the thing that's the thing <laughs> um well i think that's oh I think I've run out of questions. We can go off piste a little bit if you like, and I can ask you what's the meaning of life. You know, do you have any cool. ideas about that? It is a right, philosophy well, podcast, after um, all. Yeah, bloody hell. Yeah, that, that's that, that's a quite a philosophical question, and, and obviously, um, hey, someone that this part of, in my career, you know, that's that's definitely something a, a question I quite often, uh, you know, really wrestle with. It, when it comes to me, I guess, you know, personally, what I personally think about the meaning of life, um, I think I share this, the same perception of the meaning of life and as, as like Buddhism and other East Asian religions do. Um, and 
and it's it's ultimately you know life is is unfortunately suffering you know actively existing you have to live alongside heavy topics like death disease war horror and you've also got to suffer as well because of your own imperfections and and through society's arbitrary judgment systems you know or how you're viewed by others you know you can suffer that way you know life is cruel and, and unfortunately you, you're all you know, just by simply living, you know, you've, you, you've got to face all these challenges and all these things that you don't necessarily want to do. And, you know, and, and yeah, it's, and I suppose in some way you, know, you might think that, that that seems like as though I don't really have a high perception of life itself. But, you know, I, I do think that sort of conclusion is is somewhat wrong. You know, um, I, I think that, you know, by, that there is like this sort of, you know, there's there is this deeper significance to you know accepting suffering in life you know that that you know um it's yeah it's how can I put it the, the it's like although life may be full of suffering it isn't necessarily evil because you know by accepting the harsh reality of life and taking responsibility for what you can control you know you you, you can ultimately you know stand up to you know, that you can stand up and face all these different kind of things and challenges that, you know, and that you might be afraid of and, and ultimately become stronger and therefore a better person. You know, that even though this life may seem hopeless at times, you know, there is always a path forward. And although you may not choose to see it, you know, the path is always there. Uh, it will take you through the best and, and obviously the worst that life has to offer. You know, that, that, that's a given. Uh, and you might, you know, take a, a step or two back by taking the punches and accepting that some things are because they are, you know, there is, there, there is always that hope that you can reach nirvana, you know, this sense of balance, you know, where you finally sort of reach the stage of enlightenment and, and this greater understanding. I mean, not many people reach this because, you know, life of all, like, like with most things, you know, it, it is a challenge and kind of offering a too great for some. Or, you know, some people prefer to blame others for the tyranny of life, you know, and they may even create, you know, suffering for themselves, you know, through the consequences of karma. But, you know, all this is most of it's avoidable and only by being true to oneself, you know, by being heroic and standing in spite of, of life itself, you know, the, can life itself offer real promise? You know, it's, yeah, the, the, there is this hidden to obviously the, the suffering that, was mortals have to endure, you know, simply. And so poetry can serve that function, you know, poetry can be the machete with which you hack through the thicket of, of life kind of thing, the way forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it, it, I suppose you can also consider it a survival pack as well, you know, but like I was saying a few minutes ago, you know, the, the art, all kinds of art can, you know, can show the beauty in life. So even when you're down, you know, it gives you that sort of sense of optimism. You know, you can really see the beauty in the world, even though at a moment in time you might not see it. What's uh, would you recommend any poetry? What's your favorite? Who's your favorite poet? What's your favorite poem? Well, um, obviously, from my studies, um, I've been exposed to quite a lot of um, of poets, and, and obviously, not naturally being a poet myself, you know, there is always these different you know, people that I take inspiration from, you know, um, there's never really one source of a person that I really go to. But I suppose um, a favourite poem of mine uh, for quite a while has been Ozymandias by uh, Percy Blythe Shelley. Um, it, it's a poem that, you know, is very short, it's very it's very simple, but, you know, it, it actually features quite a lot in, um, in popular culture. You know, it, I think one of the characters from Alien Covenant, I think it was David, he sort of like, you know, quoted Ozymandias and, you know, even down the route of video games, you know, if, if that's the thing, you know, it, it was actually featured quite prominently in Civilization 4, you know, which is a game I never heard about before. Um, I fell in love with Boeing because, you know, it deals with the inevitable decline of rulers and their pretentious to greatness, you know. That this poem, even though it's like really short, you know, it really packs, you know, a lot of, of really interesting points and, you know, it, it really does an interesting perspective on life you know the, the poem itself shows that even the greatest men in the empires they forge are impermanent you know that their legacy is fated in some sense to decay into oblivion you know that once again you know that 
you know, it goes back to that sort of thing, you know, that men, or should I say human beings as a whole, you know, they, they try and dominate the earth, but, you know, inevitably there will come a time where, you know, life and nature itself will come back and, and recall. So, yeah, that's, that's one of my most favourite ones, that's for certain. Good answer. I like that one. That's a good one. It's almost like syllable perfect, isn't it? You know, the way it's constructed, it's, it's, you know, each, each line is, you know, perfect. I think, uh, is there anything you want to plug? I know you have a website. Uh, would you like to, to you know, tell people about that? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, obviously, um, I'm sort of going into my first year of English and creative, uh, English and creative writing and sort of as a part-time uh, project, you know, something to do on the side. Um, I actually write and actually organise a blog uh, on WordPress. I, I think it's uh, electrifyingly lit. Um, you can also, you can always find it, you can always find a link to my blog um, through obviously my Instagram, which is electrify with like a, like underscore and then a free and then, you know, elect, electrify and then underscore at the end. Uh, I'm sure no doubt it would probably be linked somewhere wherever it is i'll link it on the podcast yeah on this uh, video so yeah it's okay yeah excellent so basically if you're interested in a bunch of poetry if you want fiction if you want to hear more personal things more personal ravings about what i think about poetry and stuff then give a follow and you know um you can always message me you know and, and obviously if you want to collaborate or do any of the work with me then just let me know um and obviously, yeah, I, I, obviously, I, I can't wait to uh, do some more things in the future. Mm-hmm.